Next topic, uh, achievement motivation. So, McClelland Atkinson model of achievement motivation suggests that we have two personality traits um, within our motivation, which are the need to achieve and the need to avoid failure. Remember that they are your traits. They are. We, it, they suggest that we all have both. We just all have them in different degrees or in different amounts. So most people will be higher in one than the other. But both of those things motivate us. That's key that you remember that. that so your need to avoid failure, even though it's associated with being a negative thing, that can still motivate you. Your fear of failure, you don't want to lose, that can make you try harder still. All right, your need to achieve is the fact that you want to achieve it and do well and things like that. That can also motivate you. So it's obvious that the need to achieve is the better way forward. Um, and we talk about, you might get asked about the fact that what high achiever, someone with a high need to achieve, uh, what characteristics do they have? So they are persistent, whereas someone with a low need to achieve would give up easily. All right. A high achiever likes a challenge. They like 50-50 situations where they might win, they might lose. The low achiever hates that. They would rather play someone really good, so who, who it's no shame to lose against, or someone really bad who they will all easily beat. Um, a high achiever is confident, whereas the low achiever is totally lacks confident. They might be suffering from learned helplessness. When they succeed, the high achiever um, doesn't get carried away, but they tend to give themselves a little bit of a pat on the back, all right, and they'll uh, keep going for next time. When they lose, they see it as a, a, a good thing. They'll learn from their mistakes. Whereas a low achiever won't. They, you know, they see losing, that's bad because they don't like the shame of losing. Um, the high achiever likes feedback. They like to be evaluated. They like evaluating situations. They like their coach to give them feedback because that means they're going to improve. They like to be able to improve and get better. The low achiever sees feedback as anything negative as criticism, which is shameful. They don't like it. So the high achiever focuses on performance rather than outcome. The low achiever just doesn't want to lose. That's all they're bothered about. Situational factors, so achievement motivation theory is interactionist theory. So the, um, the social learning part of the theory um, is the fact that we combine the incentive value of success with the probability of success. The, if the probability of success is low, which means that you have basically no chance of winning, the incentive value is really high. So that means you, if you, you must be playing against someone really good so if you happen to beat them, then you are going to get a big reward out of it. That's the incentive value. If the probability of success is really high, that means you are basically going to win. You're playing someone not very good. Um, therefore, you don't get much incentive out of that. You don't get much of an intrinsic reward from that victory. So the theory suggests that the most motivating situation is when the probability of success is 50-50. Um, at point 0.5 because what happens here is that we might win we might lose and you can see this is that you would you would be wanting to achieve you'd be wanting to beat that person so need to achieve is kicking in but also need to avoid failure is kicking in all right because you don't want to lose to that person and if you don't perform at your best you will so you need to be motivated so the most motivating situation, which is the most important bit to remember about this, is when the probability of success is 50-50. Make sure though that you know what incentive value of success and probability of success is. Attributions. Attributions are the reasons we give for success or failure, winning or losing, or whatever. Um, so Viner's model. Viner looks at um, the locus of causality which is whether something is an internal or an external reason and it looks at the stability whether it is stable, whether it change, uh, doesn't change or whether it is unstable, whether it does change so Viner looks at those four boxes and puts them together into those categories so internal and stable is your ability All right. so I was just better than the other person on the day 
external and stable is task difficulty so that is about my opponent my opponent was just too good for me I was playing against Roger Federer all right he was just too good I had no chance internal and unstable is effort all right so the fact that I either won because I really tried my best I trained hard all week all right I put maximum effort in on the day and I worked harder than my opponent and therefore I beat them um, and it could be that we blame a defeat, for example, on an external unstable factor such as luck, the fact that the referee cost us the game with a poor decision. So, remember that um, the four groups of attributions are ability, task, difficulty, effort and luck. And remember what, whether they are internal or external. So internal or external is just whether it's to do with you or whether it's to do with other people or things and then if it's stable it means it doesn't change all right not many examples of that unstable things would change or could change linked to this is learned helplessness um, so what happens here is that we fail we lose and we would tend to this uh, a low achiever for example might attribute that failure to a lack of ability um, that means their confidence is going to suffer and if their confidence suffers it's likely to lead to another poor performance. That poor performance means they probably lose again um, and then we're into the fact that oh well I lost again because I'm not very good. That's, in, that's again that internal stable factor of ability. Once this cycle is being repeated a few times it's likely that the performer will give up yeah, so at some, at some stage, fairly quickly probably, with that sort of a person, they'll give up, they'll stop trying. They'll think that there's no point in even having a go, because they're going to lose anyway, that's what they think. So that brings us to a definition, which is that failure is inevitable. Three words for learned helplessness, failure is inevitable. That means I'm going to lose, no matter how hard I try, how well I play, I will still lose. That's how bad I am, that's what I think if I'm in learned helplessness. Learned helplessness can be specific towards a certain sport, or, I, or it can be global that I think I'm rubbish at everything. So what would I do with someone who's in learned helplessness? How would I help them if I'm the coach? Well, the first type of um, attributions I could get them to make um, is controllable ones. So if I can control something, I can do something about it. That means that if I succeed at something and I attribute it to controllable reasons, that means that I'm going to do it the same again next time. Okay? So if I attribute it the fact that I won down to the fact that I tried my best, i.e. effort, which would be internal and unstable, that's controllable. I can do something about that effort, how hard I try. So it's likely if I attribute that success to effort that I will try my hardest again the next time. On the other side of that, if I lose and I attribute that to a lack of effort, that is also good because that means I'm going to try harder next time. It might be that I have to try harder in training or actually in the match itself. This also, the other good advantage of this is that it improves the performer. Okay, so they're going to improve their performance, which will hopefully affect the results anyway. The second method I can use in attribution retraining, um, which is a phrase that's worth remembering and, and actually putting into an answer that you would use attribution retraining. It just means you're going to retrain them to make better attributions than they are doing at the moment. Is self-serving bias. So self-serving bias is something that protects my confidence. So I'm being biased towards myself in the attributions that I give. So when I win, I'm going to, get, I'm going to say that that was down to me, that I played well. That I'm going to give myself a pat on the back, that's going to increase my confidence. Remember that the, the low achiever won't do that. They'll probably say that when they won that it was lucky. So retrain them to make attributions that say, no, it was down to the fact that I played well today, I was good. That 
increases their confidence. And when we lose, we can blame it on external factors such as luck. So blame it on the referee or the, the, the rub of the green, a bad bounce, whatever it might be, the conditions that we were in. Um, blame it on something else which means that I might maintain my confidence. I'm not going to have my confidence knocked. Be careful not to use self-serving bias all the time, all right, because obviously people might work it out. The other thing a coach could do is to allow success here. So get them to succeed. Get the performer to succeed. Make it easier for them. Get them to play easier opponents. Make the task easier by splitting it down into parts and they might um, come out of their learned helplessness.